Hey everybody, Professor Kaiser here. Um, so this is where we start. We start with chapter one. Easy, easy enough. Uh, so the way these lectures work, pretty simple. I will uh, record the lecture. It's usually about an hour, hour and a half. And uh, I go through the PowerPoint. It's a PowerPoint and I go through it uh, slide by slide, uh, point by point. There'll be some photos, maps, things like that. And the lecture is where you will uh, find all your information that will be used for quizzes or the midterm or final exam. Um, let's see. Also, the weekly discussion questions that are on the discussion board. Uh, I post one question every week for you to answer as part of your attendance and participation uh, grade. That will also come from the lecture. Uh, remember at the bottom when you're watching this as well, you can hit the CC button so you have captioning. Um, that's one of the reasons we use YouTube. Uh, captions automatically, which is really handy. So, we will go ahead and get started then. So, this first chapter begins with uh, uh, the new global world. Uh, it's really focusing a lot on Native Americans, uh, focusing on European colonization of the world and uh, a little bit on the Protestant Reformation. Um, all influential things on the founding of uh, the American, the British colonies, which eventually, of course, become the United States. So first we're gonna look at Native American cultures, look at Native American cultures across North. Really, really, we're, we're just gonna focus on North America. Uh, we have Native American culture of, of Native American societies, of course, North, Central, and South. But we're just going to focus on North America because that is where the British colonists and the British colonies uh, deal with the Native Americans in the area that eventually becomes the United States. Uh, we'll also look at, as I said, European culture, religion, and colonization, uh, both in Europe and the Americas. So, who are the real first Americans? Not us, not uh, not people from Europe, um, not the Spanish. The real Americans are the Native Americans, the ones that arrived here 15,000 years ago, give or take. Um, uh, most scientific evidence points to uh, first humans coming over here, give or take 15,000 years ago, uh, across the Bering Strait. Uh, it was frozen back then. Uh, today the Bering Strait is water. Uh, it's a patch of water, you know, many miles across. Back then we were in the middle of a little ice age in north uh, northern hemisphere, and so it was frozen solid. So they simply walked across. That that it was frozen for many years. Um, we know this today through scientific evidence. We know that Native Americans are most closely related to Asian Asian peoples. Uh, genetically speaking, uh, much more so than European. So uh, the reason for that's very obvious. Um, they are directly descended from uh, the ancestors in Asia. Um, there's other there's other theories about how the, some of the early humans got here. Uh, there is some evidence uh, that they some of them might have actually sailed here by ship. Uh, you know, boat, uh, skin boats. Boats made out of wood or, or with uh, animal skin to keep them, you know, to really be watertight and float. Nonetheless, they came here, give or take around that 15, 20,000 years ago or so. And um, they moved all across the Americas from North America, Central America, South America. Uh, and over about a 5,000 year period, they, five to 7,000, they colonized all of the Americas from uh, what is modern day Alaska all the way down to the tip of um, uh, like Peru, all the way down to the tip of South America, over about a you know five to 7,000 year period. Uh, Native American tribes, I mean, there's lots of different tribes, obviously there's, at one point there was, there was a recognized over 300 different Indian tribes. Uh, most don't exist anymore. Most um, aren't around, uh, uh, tribes either, of course, were extinguished, as we will talk about, or they simply blended to with other tribes. You know, some North American tribes, Apache, Navajo, Eskimo, uh, Eskimo also referred to as the Inuit. Um, and they eventually colonize all the Americas, east, west, north, south. It takes five to 10,000 years. 
uh, to cover all of North and Central and South America. But by the time Europeans arrive here in the 1400s, Native Americans can be found across every part of the Americas, from the, the farthest north tip all the way to the North Pole, all the way down to the southern tip of South America. Um, uh, perhaps, perhaps when Europeans arrived here, there were as many as 50 million Native Americans. Now, obviously, there's no census numbers, and that's a best estimate. Um, you can find some, and this really wouldn't be history who would, who would come up with these numbers. These are probably anthropologists uh, that come up with this, and some of them suggest as much as 100 million. But 50 to 100 million, uh, I choose to go, ahead and to go with the lower number, 50 million. That's what we'll use for this class. Uh, very close, very close to that. Um, the early uh, Native Americans were uh, hunter-gatherers, probably more closely gatherer-hunters. Truthfully, they probably gathered more calories than hunted, um, contrary to the movies and whatnot. But nonetheless, hunting and gathering, the women usually did the gathering, stayed closer to the village, closer to the children, and the men would be the ones to go out into the wild and hunt. And we actually think Early humans were poor, more likely, we, we always called them hunters, but they did that. But probably more, they received the meat from scavenging, uh, simply finding dead animals or setting traps. Uh, we, we know they ran animals like in herds off of cliffs, and then the, the animals would just all run off the cliff, or many of them would run off and then, of course, fall to their death. Um, one of the things that made humans different was the brain uh, that made us different than all the other animals. And we found ways to harvest animals and their meat with the least amount of danger or threat to human life. So uh, we used to think that because almost all the large mammals in North America are extinct. Um, almost all of them went extinct after humans showed up, like the woolly mammoth and the saber toothed tiger, things like that. We used to think humans hunted them all to extinction. We know that, that that factored in, but we also think the Ice Age actually did it. Uh, the Ice Age probably drove many of those animals to extinction. Uh, they simply couldn't find meat or vegetation to, because I mean, some of these mammals are huge. I mean, the, the woolly mammoths were bigger than the largest elephants we have today. That required a great amount of calories. And so many of them simply starved to death, whether they were carnivores or herbivores, omnivores, uh, many simply starved. And then you combine that with uh, humans coming along and hunting and, and uh, really changing the whole system. Anyway, all of it together resulted in the extinction of many, many large mammals. I mean, there were beavers that were half the size of a horse. Um, those, of course. All horses. That's a great one, too. There were horses in North America before humans. Then there were none. The humans actually ate and killed all the horses. There were no horses in the Americas again until Europeans arrived and brought horses from Europe. Uh, but humans uh, uh, extinguished all the horses in the Americas. Uh, again, probably obviously eating them for meat. They didn't ride them. Uh, they never had the idea of riding horses until uh, Europeans showed up. Uh, bow and arrow was a new weapon um, that they were using, uh, which probably helped them hunting, um, helped them uh, spread out and uh, hunt down animals. We also know that this is where they developed the first religious practices, ritual, myths, uh, different skills. Um, uh, much of what we know from early humans is inside caves, uh, drawings on walls, things like that. Uh, so this would have been the early formations of, of religion, probably carried over with them from Asia when they came over. Um, it should be noted, and this is significant when the Europeans arrive, the technology Native Americans are using would be Stone Age technology. Literally thousands of years less advanced than what the Europeans arrive. When the Europeans arrive, they have cannons and weapons and guns and gunpowder, explosives and all other kinds of things. Uh, the Native Americans never stood a chance. Uh, between disease and military technology, um, and of course, Europeans thrust, uh, thirst for conquest and natural resources, Indians never stood a chance. Unfortunately, they did not. Uh, also, should be noted, they always stayed near water, near water. And this map is really great for that. 
this is a top-down look of, of the world. You have Asia here, uh, you know, Russia, what is today, Russia and China. And, and so they came from Asia, went across the Bering Strait here, Beringia, which of course was frozen at the time, but a hundred mile long land bridge frozen. And they simply came into the Americas and eventually spread out across all the Americas, every single climate area, every single region, um, almost always staying near water. Really good question, why water? Why do they always stay near water? Um, think about that. Um, that might be might be a good discussion question. Uh, you know, why do they always stay near water? Uh, there's several reasons for that. As a matter of fact, I think I think I may use that. Um, several reasons why they would have stayed near water. So I think about that. Freshwater, seawater. Uh, think about all the different purposes and staying near water sources as much as possible. Uh, this shows you a handful of different tribes. Uh, again, at one point we recognized over 300, many of them no longer exist. Uh, many different tribes, of course, uh, many of our territories and cities and, and, and different regions of America were named after these tribes. You can find almost all these different names as part of towns across the Americas, uh, estates, Iowa. Um, so, yeah, we'll find that much of what is vernacular in early America is simply borrowed or used from Native Americans. Uh, ge geographically and socio-politically. So here we'll look at specifically the Indians of North America. Uh, these were usually smaller, smaller groups, uh, tribal, um, less technology. Uh, again, pretty much Stone Age technology. We're going to look at four different cultures here. The Hopewell culture, which would have thrived around the year 100 to 400 CE. CE being the current era, common era. Um, if you're familiar with uh, BC and AD, it would be equivalent to AD. So this is 1900 to 1600 years ago. Uh, based in modern day Ohio, they were mound builders. Uh, they built large burial mounds of which some are still visible today. Uh, you can see an image here of, of uh, the Hopewell culture. This is a large mound. It's almost, if you were on the ground, it's almost as high as a human. So it's almost six feet high. You can see it's in the shape of a snake with a mouth here. Uh, that was probably for religious significance, religious purposes. Um, we know snake was a common image for many early uh, religion, spirituality. Uh, which is also interesting to note, look at the size of it. No one could actually, if you were on the ground, you'd just see a wall of, of dirt and grass. So this was purposely designed for the gods, for the gods or the spirits above to be able to look down and see uh, the Indians. Uh, this was part of their worship. Uh, Peoples of the Southwest is another group, um, often commonly called the Pueblo Indians uh, from 1000 to 1200 CE. So this is around a thousand years ago, around a thousand years ago. Uh, they built large multi-room structures of mud and stone, sometimes freestanding, sometimes actually built into hills or mountainsides. Um, they declined after 1150, probably due to soil erosion. Um, we think it actually had, had a lot to do with why many of these cultures declined, was simply misuse of the environment. Soil erosion, um, uh, uh, deforestation, things like this, we think might have often had something to do with, with their decline. Drought as well might have been a, a situation. Third one we'll mention here is the Mississippian, um, based along what is the, we later will call the Mississippi River. Uh, Mississippi River runs from New Orleans all the way up to all the way up to Canada. Uh, Mississippi in civilization, uh, 1,400 CE, so 1,000 years ago to 600 years ago, collapsing right before the right before the Europeans show up. It collapses. Uh, they had what was the largest city in North America uh, for the Native Americans, Kaukia. This is an artist sketch of Kaukia. Um, so like right in the center, what is the United States today, maybe had 20,000 population. 
just to give you a comparison, at this point in time, there are cities in Europe and Asia that have over a million, even over two million population. So this is the largest city in North America. Uh, we know they were a class society, nobles, priests, peasants, maybe this 20,000 population. They collected taxes. They were the most advanced uh, civilization in North America. Uh, they were still using Stone Age technology, but they had an advanced communication system. They built large structures, nobles, priests, peasants. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they were certainly advanced for most Native American cultures. Also falling apart after the 1300s, before the Europeans arrived. And then the last one is the early, early woodland peoples. This would be east of the Mississippi. Uh, these were usually small tribes, communal villages, uh, typically with a chief, uh, maybe even female council leaders, female leaders of the tribes. Women had a lot of authority. Women had a lot of power in these eastern woodland tribes. These are probably the most significant because these tribes are the ones that the early American settlers from Europe, well, you know, the British colonizers, this is who they usually dealt with. Uh, these were the ones they mostly dealt with. They had ceremonies. They had lots of customs and, and rules. Um, they did not believe in private ownership. Everything was communal. Everything was uh, shared, including raising children. Children were shared by the whole village. Um, and then European diseases came and pretty much killed off everything. Um, when Europeans show up, and these are the, the peoples the Europeans deal most heavily with, they, well, put it this way, the spread of European diseases, which the Native Americans hadn't had any contact with for maybe 200,000 years. It may have been as, as much as 200,000 years since uh, these peoples split off of European uh, humans. So for for you know, thousands, tens of thousands of years, they had not had any interactions with Europeans. So when Europeans show up, Native Americans had never been exposed to many of their diseases. Uh, we think European diseases probably killed off over the, the next 300 years, about 95% of all Native Americans. Um, now they were killed by other means as well, warfare, for instance, but the vast majority simply died by coming in contact with Europeans. Breathing on them, touching them, uh, interacting with them. Probably smallpox was one of the biggest things that killed them. Tuberculosis, smallpox, things like that. Uh, killing off entire villages at a time. Entire villages at a time. Uh, which makes them, of course, very weak when the Europeans do really start to spread across the continent. Many Native American tribes and civilizations are already been wiped out by the diseases. The matrilineal is where the bloodline follows the, the mother. I didn't mention that. Uh, one of the reasons women had so much authority in eastern woodland tribes was that new chiefs were chosen uh, based upon the mother. The chief would have been a man, but it was based upon the mother, not the father. European society, of course, is opposite. Uh, European society is patrilineal. Uh, the bloodline passes, the authority passes from the father to son as opposed to here, the mother to son, the mother to child. Uh, this gives you an idea of trading. Uh, this is the Pecos, uh, Pecos Pueblo uh, trading. You can see the goods they trade here, animal skins, furs, corn, pumpkins, squash, baskets, perhaps animals, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, here we have a, a Pueblo up here. So this would be neutral ground. We actually think that most Native American tribes were not warlike. There's actually minimal evidence. There, there's some evidence of, of, of war uh, weapons, but very little. Uh, as compared to Europeans, which are incredibly warlike, Native Americans look like they were much more likely to be egalitarian, uh, to be much more about trading and sharing. But of course, they had a plethora of resources. They had all of North America for a few million people. So there was no there was no population pressure. Uh, if you get close to another tribe, you simply turn and go the other direction. Most tribes were nomadic. They moved around. 
and there was plenty of resources, food and water and, and resources other directions. So we think most interactions among most Native American tribes is peaceful, uh, not violent, not aggressive. Um, so here we have them actually trading back and forth. This tribe stays out here in the teepees in sort of neutral territory. They wouldn't go inside the Pueblo, of course, that could be risky. Uh, you know, if you weren't necessarily best friends with this tribe. Um, meanwhile, you stay far enough away to protect yourself in case suddenly warriors come running out of the Pueblo. Could happen. So this is what is actually most likely reflective of most Native American culture. Uh, very, very minimal evidence of warfare. This, however, is the imagery Native American of Native American culture, which is portrayed to Europeans that the Native Americans were savages, naked, like animals, uh, using bows and arrows where Europeans are using guns, uh, and simply at war. This shows a Timucua raid in the 1560s where one Indian tribe is attacking another Indian tribe with fire arrows, burning, burning their village down, uh, shooting them and killing them. Um, so this is how Europeans portrayed Indians. Savage, animal, violent. Uh, ironic in a way. Um, Native Americans wore clothes. They wore a lot of clothes. Uh, maybe not as much Europeans. Europeans had a real social... Uh, socially, Europeans, you weren't supposed to have any part of your body uh, exposed other than your face, really. Uh, maybe your hands. But it's also ironic when you consider that it portrays Native Americans as violent and warlike, when the Europeans are probably the most violent and warlike people in the world at this time. Europeans are constantly going to war, fighting other peoples, constantly expanding empires. Um, talk about the, uh, how do we say, the pot calling the kettle black, something like that. Uh, it's interesting to think about. Uh, and it really does, it is really negative and, and racist propaganda towards Native Americans. Uh, as we'll talk more about in the coming chapters, these type of images were used to dehumanize, uh, to justify exploitation and violence against Indians, and uh, to disregard Indian culture as primitive and violent. And... Uh, all right, so let's switch gears to Europe. We'll look at Europe, Europe a little bit. Well, um, European society had been locked into a socio-political uh, mold for a thousand years. Really, since Europe reformed itself after the Roman Empire fell in the fifth century, uh, Europe reformed itself by the 800s into a feudal uh, society of lords and peasants. And a thousand years later, it still was. Um, so this is the tradition uh, of European society, which had existed now for the better part of a millennia, uh, of, of lords and peasants. And most people were peasants. Peasants are the, the poor farmers. Really poor anything. Uh, poor of any sort. But most European poor were farmers. Uh, but whether you were a laborer, farmer, whatever, peasants. Most of the peasants worked on what we would call Lord's Estate. Here's a picture of one here. Uh, the, the Lord's Estate, which would have all the peasants working as, uh, they're not slaves, but they're not far removed, honestly. Uh, they're, they're poor. They live in poverty. They have very simple clothing, as you can see from this, this drawing here. Wearing simple simple clothes, wearing, using simple tools. These, these folks don't even have shoes on. The life of a peasant was bad, a uh, very poor life, very minimal, um, always on the edge of starvation, malnutrition, uh, lived short lives. Peasants often died in, by the time they were in their 30s, uh, 40s. Life expectancy, literally like half of what it is today. Um, poor, terrible life. They, they lived there and they would be protected by the Lord, usually had knights, usually had soldiers and the peasants would produce all the agricultural products, food or cotton for clothes, or I guess in this time it would have mostly been wool, wool for clothing, which that's, that comes from sheep, but um, they, would, they would grow flax or hemp for clothes, things like that. 
uh, whatever surplus existed from the peasants' work on the Lord's estate, the manor would then be sold for profit, uh, which would go directly into the Lord's uh, the Lord's profit, the Lord's bank account. Uh, the farming cycle pretty much dictated how people lived. Uh, you you did certain things in the year depending on whether you were planting crops, harvesting crops, tending crops, or the off season in the winter when you uh, European winters are very harsh. Uh, most northern and western European winters are cold and icy. There's lots of mountains, so uh, you can't really plant crops in the winter. Um, pretty much the weather and the climate determined the way of life for Europeans when they did everything, up to when they when they procreated. Uh, only in the off season, when they had free time, would they engage in sex. They would actually plan pregnancies for the nine month in advance. They would actually just have have sex for procreation purposes on one time of the year, with the plan being that the child coming nine months later would come in between two other cycles so that it wouldn't interfere with harvesting or planting crops. Uh, surf is is a the lowest form of peasantry. It is where you are basically a slave. You're not in chains, but if you're a serf on a lord's estate, and some are simply peasants, those are free peasants, you're poor, you can technically get up and leave and walk away or, or do something else if you want to. Serfs were tied to the land. They were forced to stay on the land. They didn't own anything. They had no money. Uh, they were always in debt to their lords. So you could technically walk away as a serf, but you'd be homeless. You'd have no money. Uh, you'd be unemployed. And because you probably owe debt to your lord, they might actually send the police after you. And you might find yourself going to jail. Um, life of a peasant was tough. Life of a serf was, was really bad. Uh, um, primitive tools, low output, a twelfth of what farmers produce today uh, per person. So low output. A lot of them still using stone um, and very basic, very basic tools. Uh, wooden tools, even though they already have the ability to make iron, um, even even steel. By the time we're talking about, by the 1500s, they can make a primitive form of steel. Um, so yeah, uh, children receive little little food. Um, mortality rates, well, pretty bad. A uh, half of all people died before 21. So half of your kids would die before they reached adulthood. That was simply accepted. Most women had six, eight, 10, 12 kids. You pretty much would continue having children until you couldn't physically do it anymore. Many women died in childbirth. Um, so you might literally keep having kids until it killed you. Uh, you preferred boys. They always wanted boys. They didn't want girls. Uh, boys would be like a free labor on the farm. If you had a boy, as soon as he was old enough, he'd be out there on the farm helping father do the work on the farm. Uh, girls did not, it wasn't proper for girls to work out on the farm. They might milk animals. They might tend a little, a little garden or something near the house. And of course, they did house chores, making beer, making bread, making butter, things like this. But uh, farm work was for the men. Uh, as I said, mortality rates are really high. People died a lot. Uh, low, low life expectancy. Half of all people died before adulthood. Uh, one of the reasons religion, there's a lot, but one of the reasons religion was so important was, uh, of course, Christianity, which had covered all of Europe. So if you were in your Europe, you were most likely Christian. Um, Christianity offered an afterlife. It offered heaven. It offered a life after death, uh, a resurrection, if you will, in a blissful paradise. One of the reasons so many people were close to religion. Uh, life here on earth was miserable for peasants, which was most Europeans. It was a miserable, brutal, dirty, filthy life, living in shit and, and sleeping where your animals and never clean and always hungry. Uh, uh, and so I'm not saying people look forward to death, but I would say most people accepted death without a lot of trepidation, really. With the idea, especially if you were very faithful and religious, which most people were, you simply believed once you died, things actually got better. Life would be better. Um, we know women were 
we know women were probably closest to religion uh, for obvious reasons, having half their kids die. Um, it have to be really rough. Uh, this is one of the reasons, this is one of the causes for migration to the Americas. Uh, the rough, abusive, uh, exploited life in Europe. And then they find out there's a place in the Americas where they can go get basically free land and start all over. Uh, sometimes even portrayed as a Garden of Eden. Yeah, it's no wonder so many people came here. Uh, life there sucked. Um, so you see, it, what you need to get out of this is just simply that during different seasons is when things were done. You know, the winter, people were cold, people die frozen. We see the births happening between spring and summer because people would uh, have uh, sex and they would procreate basically after the harvest. They would harvest here at the end of the fall and then things would get cold. They would go indoors, uh, have sex, and then next summer is when all the kids would be born. Um, uh, so that happens. And then the bug here indicates this is like the height of death of uh, disease and uh, viruses and things like that killed people a lot. The Black Plague, oh my gosh, the Black Plague. Uh, Black Plague uh, over centuries killed hundreds of millions of people across Europe and Asia. So uh, the, the worst naturally occurring uh, contagion in in world history is the Black Plague, the bubonic plague, uh, which has been responsible for killing. Well, at one time, 1300s, it killed about one seventh of the entire European population. Um, that's what, 15 percent? Uh, pretty bad. So, yeah, uh, diseases would be carried. Again, Black Plague was carried by um, by uh, fleas, I think, carried by fleas that would hop from the animals to the people, bite the people and transfer the plague. So, yeah, disease was a common way of life. Well, life there in Europe was was structured. Uh, really, you were structured in three different ways. Um, hierarchy. Uh, you have lords, kings, nobles, the aristocrats. It was structured religiously. You had the religious structure of the Catholic Church. And then you'd be structured locally with your community. Your community would have its own mayor, have its own have its own leaders, its own secular and religious leaders. Um, and I suppose you could even add a fourth aspect. Life was structured with the family. Everything was patriarchal. All these categories that is mentioned, all four of them are patriarchal, male-led, male-dominated. Whether it's government, church, community, or family, it's father, uh, male dominated, um, whether it's the father or the king or, you know, the priests, all male dominated. Um, so we have these established institutions, nobility, church, village. And I even added that fourth one, which is family. All of it is like a pyramid, uh, point spreading down, uh, with the father at the top or the, the, uh, village mayor at the top, the church priest or cardinal at the top bishops or the nobility with the king and the lords and the dukes and all of those at the top. This really structured all of European life for a thousand years. This was a structure of how European life existed and had formed and had stayed, while technology had increased, certainly, uh, the actual socio-cultural life of Europe had stayed pretty stagnant for the better part of a millennia. Um, the, the, the life of a peasant in the 1700s was almost no different than a peasant in 1100. Honestly, life of a peasant, the life of your great, 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 great grandfather would have almost been exactly the same as yours. So, and a lot of that's because of these established institutions, nobility, church, village, and family. Why did people buy into this so much? Why did people buy into such such a structured, rigid society to where there was no social mobility? If you were born a poor farmer, you were going to die a poor farmer just the way it was. Uh, no social mobility because it offered stability. Uh, it offered stability. Life in Europe was rough. People died young. It was violent, constant warfare, constant invasions, whether it's the Muslims from the South, the Mongols from the East, the Vikings from the North. I mean, literally constant warfare, violence, and chaos in Europe for centuries. That is why this was so established and became so ingrained in their culture. It was the alternative. The alternative to instability, chaos, and anarchy, literally on a daily basis, was the stability of nobility, church, and village. Those are your two options. Either the rigid hierarchical society to where you're literally just one little piece in a pyramid and you're never going to go up. Or raping and pillaging and violence constantly from outside attackers. So people learn to accept it. 
even though it was oppressive and exploitive of almost everybody, except for the upper classes in those different categories, people simply accepted it. It was better. It was better than the chaos and the anarchy, uh, better than the alternative, a lesser of two evils, if you will. Um, men governed everything. I put families here, but they governed everything. Men had authority over all aspects of, of secular, which is not religion, and of course, sacred, which is religious. Everything in society can pretty much be divided between the two. Today or then, doesn't matter. Pretty much everything is either secular or sacred. Sec and I said it wrong. Secular or sacred. Um, pretty much everything is. Either it's religious or not religious. Uh, no matter what economic class you were, uh, the men governed the family, from the richest to the poorest. Uh, Christian teachings justified all this. The Bible uh, states very clearly in many passages uh, to the effect of women should be obedient to men. Women should be respectful of men, whether it's the father or the husband. Uh, in the Bible, women are, are equated to children. Um, so Christian justifications for this are common. Um, however, women did get a dowry. So there was a little bit of something. Uh, this was a responsibility. The fathers had to give some of their wealth, even if they had almost none, whatever they had available. They had to give it to their daughters uh, when the daughters started a new family. And so the father had to give whatever he had, a piece of it, to his daughter, who would then take that and give it to her new husband, her new husband, who would then, she would be part of his family. Um, and this was actually almost a legal separation. Once your daughter married a man in another fam a, a, a different man, obviously in a different family, that's it. He, she's pretty much part of another family now. Uh, another reason they didn't want daughters, this idea to where you had to provide for the daughter because daughters were seen as liabilities. If you realize what the dowry is, really, it's a bribe to get another man to take your daughter off your hands. That's exactly what the dowry started out as. Back in the time, you go all the way back to the 800s, back in the time of, of you know, the, 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 the uh, oh, wow, the Franks and, 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 back before there ever was a France or Germany or anything. Uh, it was part of the Weir Guild. I'm not going to go into detail on that. All you need to understand is the dowry was really a payoff uh, to get the man to take your daughter off your hands. Uh, uh, anyway, interesting. The dowry we still have today really in a form. Uh, you've heard of the father paying for the wedding in a, in a marriage. You know, the father of the bride pays for the wedding. That's still a tradition you'll hear people talk about or participate in. Same thing, that's a dowry. The father paying for the wedding, paying, putting up the money for the wedding. That's basically, it's, it's, the, it's the modern form of the dowry. We still do it today. Um, children were to work for their fathers, uh, usually into their late teens and 20s. Uh, then they would go off and start their own family. Um, uh, spouses were chosen. Marriages were arranged. Very standard marriages were arranged back then. Uh, fathers would give his land or his authority to his oldest son. This is called primogeniture, giving it to the first child, the firstborn. Um, the most common way we would see that, as most people might be familiar with, the son inherits from the father. So the father passes down his land to his son, and the son is the one who takes over when the father dies or retires. Um, that's the eldest son. Well, the problem then is what happens to son number, because say you had four kids, say you had four boys, that would have been common. The first son, primogeniture, the eldest son, he gets the land. What happens to son two, three, and four? Where do they go? Uh, well, they had nowhere to go other than simply become a landless poor peasant or serf until they discover America. And that's one of the reasons I really go through all this to understand uh, how and what Europeans, because all of the early American settlers were Europeans for the first 200 years, all Europeans. So all those Europeans that came to America and founded the United States, really, this was the way life was. This was their tradition. This is what they were raised on. And these landless poor are the ones who come here, the second, third, and fourth sons. They don't have land. Father's given out his land. If he's got any extra land, it goes to his daughter for dowry. Therefore, what do the other boys do? They can either be poor, landless peasants and work on their father or their brother's land, or they can go to this new thing we've heard about, 
this place across the ocean known as America. And then the land is free, and there's, there's a ton of it, as much as you could ever want, free for the taking. Well, hell, sign me up. And there you go. There you go. Oh, this joke down here is really funny. Do you want kids? Yes. A male heir to continue my line. Get it? Line? Because they're, yeah, hopefully you get it. Um, all right. Let's talk about the religion a little bit, church and religion. Well, religion governed all society. Um, the Catholic Church was ubiquitous in Europe. It was everywhere. It was everything. The church was tied into the government. Most kings were what we would call divine kings. They ruled by divine right. Kings of, Europe, of England and France and Germany, they ruled by divine right. They claimed that they were part God or that God had given them the right to rule. Convenient. Uh, it's a good way to have authority. Uh, how can you challenge someone if they say, well, God is the one who, who gave me this authority? Because what is the one thing that can never be wrong? God. God can never be wrong. So if God gave me the power, I guess you just have to take their word for it, like most people did. Um, the Pope sat on the top of the Catholic Church. The Pope had the most authority. Then, of course, there's Catholic, uh, there's cardinals, bishops, priests, and, you know, many, there's many ranks. There's many ranks in the Catholic Church. Um, these Christians shared this common idea of God, this common heritage of God and history through the churches. Uh, this was the church in Europe, was the Catholic Church. There are other Christian churches at this time. There's Eastern Orthodox, there's, there's Arian, there's other types of Christian churches um, at this point in time. But Catholic is the one that dominates, uh, certainly dominates European society. Uh, they share a common view of history, of the church, and, and God, and Jesus, and, uh, yeah, um, through the church's scholarship and teachings, and, of course, enforced compliance. If you're in Europe, you could not really be non-Christian, because they would label you a heretic, they would label you a pagan, and, well, I mean, they might literally kill you. Uh, you've heard of the witch trials, you've heard of witches being burned at the stake. Those were simply people who challenged the Catholic Church and wanted to worship different religions. Um, the Church caught them and killed them. Um, the Spanish Inquisition, the French Inquisition, the Italian Inquisition, they would go out and hunt people down and torture them until they recanted of their sins and praised uh, or, or converted over to Catholicism. Um, this was not stuck in one part of Europe. We see this all across Europe from north, south, east, west. Uh, the Catholic Church did not really allow any naysayers. You either were with us or against us. Uh, there really wasn't much room for middle ground with the church. Uh, before the rise of the Catholic Church, most Europeans were what we would call pagans. The best definition of pagan is simply non-Christian. Uh, simply believing in any other type of other gods, any other type of religious belief. Uh, the most common thing most people would be familiar with is like the Roman gods. Mount Olympus, the Roman or the Greek gods. That's just one small picture. Lots of people worship different gods before Christianity came to dominate Europe. Uh, lots of them did. They believed in the natural world. They believed in spiritual forces. They believed in, they had shrines and they would go worship in the woods and give uh, animal offerings and food offerings, um, sacrifices, not human sacrifices, but animal sacrifices. Things like this were really common. Uh, well, priests, Catholic priests, came to teach that pagans, that there was a, a, a supernatural being above all their gods. In essence, there is a God above their gods. And then, of course, there's Jesus, who's this half man, half God that was uh, brought down to earth. And they use these ideas of Jesus and God to show how this God, the Christian God, was here to save everybody from sin and pain. And of course, they start talking about an afterlife. Afterlife did not really exist in paganism. Uh, very few pagan beliefs anywhere really believe in an afterlife. You see a little bit in like Egypt, cult of Isis, things like this, but most do not believe in an afterlife. Um, and so convincing people to switch was challenging. They found ways around this. Uh, now, this is a process that took a thousand years. This didn't happen overnight. The process is very interesting. Uh, first of all, convincing people that afterlife is real, 
uh, and it is much more and more pleasant and happier than life here on earth. Well, that's helpful. Another thing Christi Christianity did was it took all the pagan festivals and simply converted them over. Uh, pagan festivals, um, like our Easter, for instance, was simply a pagan spring holiday. Our Christmas was a pagan uh, uh, winter festival. Um, they simply took the pagan holidays and repurposed them for Christian holidays, uh, made them into Christian, uh, Christian religious festivals. So the people got to worship on the same days. They got to continue to eat the same extra food. For many people, the, the religious holidays, the only time they ever got meat. Meat was reserved only for the elite. So commoners didn't get to eat meat unless on a special holiday. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so they repurposed these pagan holidays into Christian holidays and gave, uh, they allowed the people to celebrate, take time off of work, have uh, freedom. Um, uh, There's even times when the rich would serve the poor, things like this. Uh, they simply then rename them. And you're still worshiping on the same day, still doing the same thing, only now instead of worshiping your pagan god so-and-so, you're worshiping our Christian god. And here have some more meat. Bribery. Bribery and, and trickery were simply used to get people to, to go over to Christianity because ultimately Christianity really offered nothing different than pagans. Did it change anyone's life? No, it didn't really make life any different for anyone. Uh, the only way it made your life was after death, which no one could actually prove. So it didn't improve your life in any way noticeably. So there had to be ways to convince people to switch over to say like, well, it's advantageous to do it. Another really important way that paganism converts to Christianity is the leaders. Most European society leaders, the aristocracy, um, they came to become Christian. And once they converted over, it was then, it sort of behooved the population, hey, the king is Christian, we need to be Christian too. Um, and then, of course, by the 11, 1200s, the persecutions began. The Inquisitions, the persecutions, that lasted for 200 years. To where uh, different Catholic kings and religious authorities all across Europe, all for the Catholic Church, came to persecute, attack, uh, torture, uh, exile, um, even even outright murder, burn at the stake. Anyone who was a pagan or a heretic or anyone who challenged, um, challenged authority. And we also know the idea of Satan was something that was really birthed in the Middle Ages as well. The idea that there was a Satan. And Satan specifically was created by the Catholic Church as an anti-God, as an opposite of God. Um, and we then it became written into the scripture, written into the Bible, and it became this idea. It was personified by the, by the Christian church as if you are not Christian and of God and believing in God and Jesus, and you're a pagan, then you therefore must be of Satan. Uh, and Satan was, of course, demonized, literally, uh, as the monster, as the evil, as the destroyer of everything, and all evil and sinful. So therefore, paganism becomes synonymous with evil. Therefore, you can't be pagan anymore. You have to be Christian, otherwise you're an evil, despicable person. Uh, that is a danger to the entire community. Um, because evilness was often thought to be almost like a disease. If you're evil, it will bleed out and actually infect other people. So to be pagan meant you were you're, you're evil, you were diseased. And so um, they would root out heretics, either physically, violently, or even, even through murder or persecution. Then in the, like, uh, the year 1000 or so, of course, we start having more run-ins with Islam, the Muslims, uh, the Crusades, which is almost a 200-year war between the Catholic Christians and the Muslims in the Middle East. It's about a two century war, which is where the Christians were attempting to retake the Holy Land, uh, Jerusalem, um, which was the center of the Muslim world at the time, or well, it wasn't the center, but a big part of the Muslim world. Um, Islam is founded around 632 by Muhammad. Um, that, may, that may be the right way to put it. He died in 632, I believe. It would have been founded 20 years before that, technically, uh, by Muhammad. Um, they were the fastest growing religion in world history. Uh, within 150 years, Islam had conquered all of Northern Africa, 
all of Southern Europe, uh, Western Asia, all the way to the edge of India and China, um, uh, the Arabian Peninsula. It was, again, it was an incredibly fast growing religion. And for centuries, it butted right up against Christian Catholic uh, Europe. And so constant violence, constant warfare. This helped fuel the Christian arguments against paganism and heretics, because of course, Muslims weren't Christians. Although interestingly enough, if you actually studied Islam or ever re really read about it, Islam and Christianity have far more in common than, than separate. They're, they're really very similar religious beliefs. Uh, uh, Islam believes in Jesus. Islam believes in Abraham, the, 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 the founder of, of uh, Judaism. So, yeah, truthfully, the similarities between Islam and Christianity are far more than the differences. However, they were competing religious ideologies, and both sought to destroy the other and to take over the other's lands. This led us to centuries of warfare and violence between Christians and Muslims that we could say still influences us today. Uh, well, Judaism also was a problem for the Catholic Church. Um, Jude, Jude, Jews, Hebrews, had been persecuted for, well, ever, and... Jews lived comfortably and equitably among many Muslim communities. Muslims accepted. Uh, it, it, Islam actually was very accepting of other religious beliefs. There were Christians that lived among Islam. They had no problem with that. You had to pay a special tax. If you were not Muslim, you had to pay a tax. But other than that, uh, uh, Jews and Christians lived all through the Muslim communities, and they had no problem with it. Um, but because so many people who were Jewish did live uh, in the middle of Muslims and the fact that their languages are similar and their writing is similar, many Christians came to associate Jews with Muslims. And so attacks on heretics and attacks on uh, pagans often would be attacks on Jewish people too. Uh, Jewish people were killed, uh, towns burned down, uh, they were... Uh, they were uh, kicked out of areas. They were uh, forcibly relocated out of Christian cities. So the attacks on paganism and heretics often extended to anyone, literally anyone who wasn't uh, in line with the Catholic Church. Uh, this is a history which lasted through most of the next millennia all across Europe and Southern Europe and uh, Western Asia. Power of religion cannot be understated. It was the end-all, be-all of European society in almost every way. This gives you an idea of uh, the trade system. This is one of the reasons Europeans started exploring the world. Due to the crusades between Europe and Islam, which really closed off the borders between European Christians and Muslim here in the Middle East, well, as Europeans dealt with the Muslims in the Middle East, they started getting access or experience with a lot of uh, new types of luxuries, spices and silk and cinnamon and all kinds of things. And then the Crusades ended and the borders between Islam and Christianity pretty much closed up. They built walls, they built castles, they built barricades. I mean, literally Christians and Muslims shut themselves off from each other as a way to sort of stop the violence, because as long as they were continuing to go back and forth, warfare just continued, again, over 200 years. Um, however, by doing this, they cut off the trade routes too. I mean, don't get me wrong, it wasn't completely cut off. There was still some trade going across the Silk Roads from China to Europe, but minimal. And so Europeans had to find another way to access all that stuff. They had to find another way to get the silk and the gems and the spices and the cinnamon and, and opium and everything else. They had to find ways to get it. And so they start sailing around Africa looking for a way to Asia. And they do. In the 1400s, they eventually get all the way around Africa and find they can sail ships to India and China to get all those luxury resources and then bring them back. I mean, literally a boatload of spices was worth gold. It was worth a ship of gold. Uh, spices and cinnamon was worth almost equal weight to gold. So if you could get a ship all the way to India or China, fill it up with some type of luxury resource, and then make it back to Europe, you were done. You were set for your entire life. That would be more money you could make in that one to two years, and that's how long it took to get there and back, assuming you made it, you didn't die. Uh, starvation, disease, pirates, natural weather occurrences, you name it. If you made it back, that one to two years, that was it. You were, I mean, that was your entire life's earnings or more. 
how you were rich. This is one of the reasons they start exploring the world. They are looking for routes to Asia. Uh, and many go around Africa until a couple of them decide to actually go west, namely Columbus. And boom, he runs into Asia. No, he runs into America, but he thinks it's Asia. Um, this is really just a close-up of where it really shows the Europeans going around Africa. It shows the trade routes, the Silk Road, which still exists, but many of the goods aren't simply coming through anymore, and they're much more limited. Uh, during the 200 years of the Crusades, we had people in Europe going all the way back and forth here, bringing all kinds of stuff back. Then that ended in the 1200s, and suddenly most of those luxuries were cut off, and people had to find other ways to find, get them. Um, and they start going around the world. All right, so we come to Columbus. Uh, we have here Europeans exploring America. Ferdinand and Isabella, these were the king and queen of Spain and Portugal. Uh, they were convinced by Columbus to sponsor an exploration, uh, an exploration to the Americas. It wasn't the first uh, one he had proposed. He was actually Italian. He was a Genoan, I think. But he had had some failed ventures with Italian merchants, and they wouldn't sponsor his voyage. Uh, Ferdinand and Isabella believe that he will bring fame and glory, or he promises that. He promises gold and treasure and slaves and all that. In August of 1492, three ships, Columbus with his three ships, traveled about 3,000 miles west. You'll see that there on the map, about 3,000 miles west. And he reaches India. Well, he calls it India. Uh, what we end up calling it, or what he ends up calling it, is the West Indies. Um, he believes he's found a route to India and China. Of course he hasn't. What he's found is what we would call today the Caribbean. He's found the Caribbean. He actually lands at the Bahamas. Lands at the Bahamas. Um, he calls these people Indians because he thinks he's found India. That's where we get the term Indian from, uh, thinking he'd actually found the real India. And ultimately, we end up calling it the West Indies. Um, again, thinking he had found India. And then what is the East Indies is Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is the East Indies. Columbus returns. He reports to the Spanish king and queen uh, that he had found no gold, but he had heard stories of gold. He had heard that there was gold in other places. He also promised something else. He promised slaves. He had found a new form of slaves, a new source of slaves in the Indians. Uh, he makes multiple more trips. Uh, he ends up helping colonize the West Indies, colonize the Bahamas. He takes slaves, Indian slaves, back to Europe. Um, no fortune. He never finds the gold he promises. He never finds the golden wealth. He does find a few things. He does find some gold. Uh, the Native Americans are actually walking around with gold jewelry. Um, in his logic, in European logic, anyone who wore gold jewelry in Europe was rich and wealthy. Since the Indians weren't rich and wealthy, Columbus's reasoning is such. If they're walking around wearing gold and using gold as an everyday substance, that must mean there's gold everywhere. There must be just masses of gold that even common poor people can have gold. That's what he's hoping for. Doesn't really work. Doesn't really happen. Doesn't really find it. Of course, Columbus is a monster. Um, I do hope we move to the day here in America where we stop celebrating Columbus as a hero. He's not an American hero. He discovered America, uh, although technically he wasn't the first. Actually, it was the Vikings. But effectively, because the Vikings ended up dying out or leaving, uh, he discovered America. But he, for instance... A uh, Catholic priest with him wrote a story that Columbus told the Indians they had to show up with gold in both hands. And any hand that didn't have gold, he would cut off. And he did. He also authorized his sailors to rape and take uh, any Native American women, including little girls, uh, as young as 11 or 12, to take as wives or to be used for sexual purposes to satisfy his men. And the Catholic priest wrote about this that accompanied him. Uh, it was so bad that when Columbus went back uh, on his second or third voyage and returned to Europe, 
the priest reported the, the atrocities he had done. And this is this, this time period, too, and you have to understand atrocities against indigenous peoples were common. Uh, that it was so bad what Columbus did, they threw him in prison. They threw him in chains into prison. Anyway, he's certainly not really a hero of any sort we should be celebrating. Uh, he was a monster. He was a criminal. And uh, so Amerigo Vespucci is the one uh, that we got the name here. That's why we live in uh, uh, America as opposed to Colombia. Uh, Amerigo is the one who made the map. He made the map of the New World. It wasn't exactly accurate, but it was close. And he na labels this new land uh, America, meaning the land of Amerigo. We have Columbus here. We've got Ferdinand and Isabella. And then, of course, we have Amerigo Vespucci. So he's the one that labels the uh, America as the Nuevo Mundo, the New World. America, the land of Amerigo. Oh, boy. I bet they had to make Columbus mad. Um, how he didn't get he didn't get it named after him. Anyway, we have a saying in history. Uh, the victor is the one that writes the story. Um, and I'm paraphrasing that. Seems like it applies to Amerigo, too. He's the one that wrote the map, so we got to name it after himself. Um, for the first, basically the first 150 years, America was ruled uh, by the Spanish. The Spanish are the ones that came here and really took over. Uh, the Spanish, for the first 150 years, colonized North, Central, and South America. They called it New Spain. Of course, with them, they brought disease. Uh, they subdued the Native American peoples looking for gold looking for slaves. They took slaves back to Amer to uh, Europe. They died. They died almost immediately. Um, Native Americans proved to be very poor for slaves. Uh, the disease mainly, uh, susceptibility to European diseases, smallpox and whatnot. Um, no immunity to disease. Hundreds of thousands died by smallpox, measles, influenza. Um, this greatly aided the European conquest. Made it a lot easier to conquer a land when everybody died. All you literally had to do was show up, talk to them, give them blankets. Europeans were known to do this, to give them blankets, uh, which, of course, they knew had European germs in them. Come back two weeks later and everybody's dead. Uh, it certainly aided the European conquest of the Native Americans. Um, the, the Spanish conquered the Aztecs in Mexico, the Incas in Peru, uh, Spanish and Portuguese together. With Spain, they brought their institutions of government, law, and church. Of course, the Catholic Church, um, the Spanish government, the municipal councils, the legal code. They, in essence, and this happened with all the countries, Europe, uh, England, uh, pardon me, Europe's the continent, uh, England, Spain, France, Portugal, all of them. When they came to America, they basically transferred all those institutions we talked about a little while ago to America whether it was a family, church, the government, the community, they simply transferred all those ideas, the traditions and the rules to America. Um, let's see another thing they did. Uh, they built encomiendas. The encomienda is the forerunner to the slave plantation. Uh, this is actually where the idea how to build the slave plantations we used in North America. Um, they were slave plantations for the Indians, for the Indian peoples. Uh, the Spanish encomiendas. They they farmed or harvested sugar, silver, cattle. Um, for a hundred years, the number one source of silver in the world was the Spanish silver mines in Mexico. Uh, I don't know if it was even called Mexico at the time, but what is modern day Mexico? Um, yeah, pretty bad. Uh, lots of food exchange as well. We start calling the Colombian exchange of goods. 350,000 Spanish men came to America. The exchange of food and animals across the Pacific Ocean between Europe and America. Uh, maize, maize, which is corn. Uh, potatoes, manioc, uh, sweet potatoes, manioc's a root. Uh, sweet potatoes, tomatoes. Uh, it greatly increases agricultural yields on both sides of the Pacific pardon me, the Atlantic, both sides of the Atlantic, uh, increases population growth as well. A more diverse food supply increases population growth. We see different animals and different plants being exchanged back and forth across the Atlantic, which benefits both. I want to say it differently. It benefits the growth of Europeans in Europe, and then it benefits the growth of Europeans in America. It does not in any way benefit the Indians. Native Americans die, well, as I said earlier, 
over the next couple hundred years, 95% of all Indians die, uh, almost entirely of disease. Um, pretty bad. Uh, silver was a big exchange, number one source of silver. This made uh, Spain the richest country in the world for over 100 years. But they never really capitalized on that. They never really conquered America. They were the only real Europeans over here for almost 150 years and never really conquered the continent, really. Um, they just sucked out natural resources. See, hundreds of thousands of Spanish come here, mostly poor, unmarried, unskilled, um, and they blend with the local population, of course. They take Native American wives and start raising families, and we call these the mestizos. It's a generic term, basically meaning mixed race. Mixed race with European blood. So mixed race with something European. So European Native Americans, European Blacks, I mean, eventually they start bringing over Africans as slaves. Any type of a mixed race with European blood in it. Um, and this pretty much becomes all of Central and South America. Um, today, genetically speaking, almost all people that live in Central and South America, Latinos, genetically, when they're tested, find that they have European blood in them. Uh, and that would not be any way other than simply the conquest of Americas, because true Native Americans have been separated from Europe for probably 200,000 years or 150,000 years. So to have European blood would almost require that it had to be somewhere in their bloodline is the mestizos, uh, this mixed race. But hundreds of thousands came over and they had families and they took Native American women. And uh, that's just the Spanish we're talking about. It doesn't include the Portuguese, the French, the British, the Dutch and other countries that eventually come over and uh, inter interrelate and interproduce with uh, Native American peoples. Uh, we see Spanish conquest here. This is focusing on Central and South America. Uh, Santo Domingo, Hispaniola, Cuba, Puerto Rico. Uh, we have, well, this would have been the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Incans are down here in what would be uh, Peru. Um, the Spanish or the Portuguese conquered all these peoples. Sometimes all they had to do was show up and they would simply kill them with disease. Um, uh, the Spanish conquered the Aztecs, which were a million people uh, in a year or a year and a half with uh, 600 Spanish. 600 soldiers conquered the entire Aztec empire, which had lasted for centuries. Um, now, I thought the Aztecs were great people. The Aztecs did human sacrifice. They were pretty brutal. The Aztecs were basically slave mongers. Uh, they were slave masters. They enslaved all the other local Native American tribes. One of the reasons it was so easy for the Europeans to beat them is they were able to get all the other uh, local tribes in Central America to rise up against the Aztecs because the Aztecs were monsters. They were, they were slave owners of other tribes and they did human sacrifices of other tribes. Um, so uh, anyway. Uh, basically, the sins of the Aztecs brought upon them their defeat eventually. Uh, the Mayans fell around that same time period. The Incans fell, I think, to the Incans fell to the Portuguese. Don't quote me on that. I think that sounds right. Um, your book in this chapter talks more about those other uh, cultures. I'm not really focusing on them. I'm just mostly focusing on North America. Uh, this shows the Columbian Exchange. It, it's simply the generic term used for all the goods, um, disease, everything. So goods, animal, food, disease, plants, everything that is exchanged between the Americas and Europe. You might, some might actually toss in Africa as well, um, but we give a different name to that later on. When we start talking about Africans, we start calling it the Triangle Trade System, the Triangle Exchange. At this point, when we're saying Columbian exchange, it's really when the Spanish controlled the Americas and the goods and exchange of all those things between Spanish America and Europe, really, is what we're talking about primarily. All right, the last thing we will talk about in this chapter is the Protestant movement, the Protestant Reformation. This is, oh, let me adjust my screen here for a minute if I can do that. Okay, we should be back. I uh, Part of the words were cut off on top, so hopefully you should see those okay now. Um, this is the Protestant Reformation, which is incredibly significant because just about everyone who comes to found the British colonies is Protestant. And yet, before 1500, there was no such thing as Protestant. It was a brand new religious group and eventually becomes the most dominant religion in North America. 
However, this is how it starts. It didn't exist until the 1500s. Martin Luther, right here, is an image of him, a painting of him. He was a German monk, a professor, a theologian, meaning he was a, a teacher of religion. Um, Martin Luther, he sought to reform the Catholic Church. He did not seek to create a new religious. He did not create to seek to split the Catholic Church. That was never his plan. He simply wanted to reform. Reform means change and improve. He simply wanted to reform the Catholic Church. He was, a, again, he was a Catholic monk. Um, he had problems with some things with the church. He thought in some ways the church was corrupt, especially financially, and he wanted some changes to be made. He wrote the 95 Theses. A thesis simply is an argument. He wrote the 95 Theses, which was 95 arguments pertaining primarily to one topic, indulgences. 95 Theses uh, specifically about indulgences. Condemning the church for selling indulgences. Yes, they were selling them. An indulgence in its simplest form, it's a certificate offering uh, a pardon from sin in the afterlife. In essence, you sin here on earth, you go to a priest, uh, you pay the priest some money, the priest signs a little document, gives you a pardon, and you're now free of all your sins. Wow, how nice, how convenient. Isn't that grace? Isn't that, <laughs> look at that, I said the wrong word. Isn't that great? Uh, all you got to do is uh, commit whatever sins you want and go to a Catholic priest to give them a little bit of money and they'll sign away your sins and you're all good to go. Big problem. Um, Luther said this was this was bad, really, really bad uh, for a couple reasons. One, it's not legitimate. You simply can't sign away your sins by paying some money to the church. So what the church is doing is basically conning people. Um, it's a, It's a... You know, it's a scheme. It's simply to make money, uh, to uh, make money for the church. Um, furthermore, he argued, you are committing maybe the greatest crime. You are condemning all these people to hell. Because by not giving them proper penance and not giving them proper salvation um, of their, for, for their sins by, by taking the proper actions uh, through the Catholic faith, they are not actually being forgiven of their sins by God, but they're being told they are. So they walk out of the church thinking they're forgiven when they're actually not, which means if they never do proper penance, they're actually, their soul is damned to hell. So what the church is doing is damning the entirety of Europe. And it's an exaggeration. Everyone was doing this. Although we do believe there are hundreds of priests doing this all across Europe. Um, you're condemning thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of people to eternal damnation. And you're cheating and lying to them, which, of course, would be a sin, and you're doing it for purely profit. He argued that grace of God was actually a free gift of God. You didn't have to pay for it. Literally, you just had to ask God for forgiveness and truly feel repentant of your sins, and that there was actually no need of clergy. He argued that the entire Catholic hierarchy of bishops and clergy was really unnecessary. Anyone could talk to God. Anyone could ask God for forgiveness if they were truly repentant of their sins. They didn't have to pay money for it. They could simply ask and be forgiven if they were truly uh, you know, repentant. So he says this is a real problem with the church, and the church needs to change, repent. Uh, itself, the church needs to change, repent, and make these adjustments. Well, the Pope dismisses Luther. Excommunication. He kicks him out of the church. Uh, essentially condemning Luther's soul to damnation uh, because now he can no longer get the protection of the church. He can't go to Christian heaven. He can't go to that. So an interesting thing occurs. This becomes public knowledge. And the German princes, these are like little kings, lords, all in Northern Europe, uh, hundreds of them, actually. Uh, many, many of them rally to his protection and actually say, we're going to defend Luther. We're going to stand up for him. We're going to protect him. We're going to give him uh, protection. And these people who start to follow Luther and do what Luther says and believe the church needs to change, we start calling them Lutherans, followers of Luther, Lutherans. They, protect, they say they'll protect him from arrest. The Catholic Church says he's to be arrested. He's to be thrown in chains etc. And they also say they're going to protect him from the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which is uh, sort of a quasi-German empire in Eastern Europe. 
Uh, it was not Roman. It was not holy, either one. Nonetheless, what this does is it creates a division in Europe between German princes who are pr protecting and, and, and standing up for Luther, uh, who is protesting the Catholic Church. That's where the movement comes from. It's protesting the Catholic Church, hence Protestants. Um, and the Catholic Church, and especially uh, Spain and France, because both Spain and France are Catholic countries, and both the France, Spain and the French kings are standing up for the Catholic Church. So this basically pits Southern and Western Europe versus Northern and Eastern Europe, Lutherans versus Catholics. And it actually explodes into a war. It explodes into a war in the ninth, pardon me, in the 1520s that goes from approximately 25 to 55. So almost a 30 year war, not to be confused with the 30 years war, which is a different thing, but it's approximately a 30 year war that goes through Central Europe. Hundreds of thousands of people die. Uh, eventually, King Charles of Spain calls for an end to the war, bringing the war to a close in 55 with the Peace of Augsburg. Um, the Peace of Augsburg is a document agreed to and signed by both sides, German Lutherans or Protestants as they're usually called now, versus uh, Spanish, Italian, Catholics. And what it does is it officially divides Germany into different provinces. Some of the German provinces are Protestant and some of them are Catholic or Lutheran mostly. What this does is it creates a new religious division in the Catholic Church. And this is a new because there's been others. The Catholic Church has split multiple times in the past. So another division in the Catholic Church. And we get this official piece which recognizes effectively the Protestant Lutherans. And we get the largest and most significant split in the, the, uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, and we now have the Protestants and the Catholics. Protestants mostly in Northern Europe. Catholics mostly in Southern and Western Europe. So now let's talk about the growth of the different Protestant groups. There's multiple Protestant religious faiths uh, that all fall under the umbrella of Protestant. Lutheran is one. All the rest of these I'll mention Pretty much all of them are what we will call Protestant because they all are an outgrowth of the Protestant movement, even though they all have their own names, Baptist and Lutheran and Calvinist and, and Presbyterian and, you know, a dozen others. They're all considered Protestant faiths because they all came about after the Protestant Reformation. John Calvin right here, he wrote the Institutes of, he was a French a uh, theologian living in Switzerland, I believe. Uh, he was a French uh, religious teacher living in Switzerland. He stressed human weakness and God's power. This becomes a standard belief in many Christian faiths, Protestant faiths. God is all powerful. Humans are all weak. Um, and we are all at the mercy of God. This is a common thing you will see in many Protestant churches. Um, I'm I'm Protestant faith, so I can't speak to Catholic faith. But in Protestant churches, you hear this this phrase used all the time: "Humans are weak, and God is all powerful, and we are at His mercy." Um, this becomes a common uh, theme in uh, Protestant Christian faith. He wrote the Institutes of Christian Religion in 1536. He preached the notion that God will choose certain people, and these certain people are chosen before birth, literally at the time of conception. In the womb, um, uh, God has already decided whether or not you are going to serve God in our in the world. You're going to be someone who's saved, protected, and serve the human population uh, as sort of a representative of God. This is called predestination. It becomes very important uh, as we talk about America, oh, as we talk about American people who come here. Uh, and by the way, anyone else who's not predestined is damned to hell. So when you're born, it's already been decided whether you are going to heaven or you're going to hell. And there's nothing you can do about it during your entire lifetime. That's what predestination and Calvinism believes uh, in this time period. Um, another thing that uh, Calvinism believed in was that the total authority and the power in government must be religious. 
Basically, the government was ruled by the Protestant uh, Calvinists. So their entire society, secular or sacred, was all governed by the church. So the church had authority over all aspects of society. Um, no frivolity, no luxury, lived a very austere, simple lifestyle. Um, Calvinist teachings are uh, influential upon Presbyterian, um, uh, influential upon Puritans, um, Scotland, England, things like that. Uh, the Puritans, of course, are the ones coming to America. Uh, let's see what next we'll talk about is... Um, uh, oh, I did want to mention something. If you go back to Martin Luther here, number one, Martin Luther also saw that the Bible was uh, was translated into German. Uh, and then later after that, we see the Bible translated into other vernacular languages. Vernacular meaning is common, like French, English, German, stuff like that. That was also a big, big reason that the Catholic Church, that faith splits from the Catholic Church. Uh, the fact that everybody can read the Bible now, when previously most Bibles were in Latin, and Latin was, well, even this time, Latin is pretty much already a dead language. So we're only, the only church or academia ever uses Latin. All right, so let's go back to number three here. Um, English Protestantism is very significant as well. This happens with Henry VIII. Uh, the Pope refuses to annul his marriage. He has a marriage um, to Catherine of Aragon. He wants to get a divorce. The Pope says no. So because the Reformation has occurred, um, the English king says, well, you know what? I'll make my own religion. And exactly what he does. He separates from the Catholic Church and creates his own religion we call Anglicanism. Anglican, he names himself the head of the Anglican Church. He's also the, the king of England. He's able to give himself a divorce. How convenient. Um, yeah. Uh, Protestantism is very small initially, but then it does start to spread through England. And again, we call this the, today you'll hear referred to as the Church of England, uh, which is Anglican, Anglicanism. It does spread. Henry's daughter, Queen Elizabeth, does some interesting things. Um, she changes Anglicanism. She's the one that really makes it the way it is. She, it's a Protestant faith, technically, but the church looks in every way like it's Catholic. The churches look like Catholic. They have priests. They have bishops. It basically is the Catholic faith, only with a different name. And, of course, England controls it. They're not controlled by the Catholic Church in Rome, Italy, by the Pope. Um, it's interesting. Uh, he also combines Calvinist teachings with Luther's doctrines. So we get a mixture of Anglicanism, Calvinism, Lutheranism, with a church that basically still looks like it's Catholic. Um, it's quite interesting. Now, a lot of people challenged this. A lot of people were upset. Uh, here's the bottom line. People who didn't want to be Catholic wanted their own church. They wanted the Church of England to be separate and unique. Instead, when they went to the Church of England, Anglican Church, it looked like the Catholic Church, sounded like the Catholic Church. They preached like the Catholic Church, but they called themselves different. People wanted a pure church. They wanted a pure Protestant church, not a simply a facsimile of the Catholic Church. They were we call the Puritans. They wanted a pure church that wasn't just a copy of the Catholic Church. They wanted it truly to be unique and different. However, this is not typically accepted in, in England, and so they're persecuted, they're attacked, they're kicked out of, the, of England. Um, they want a different type of church, and England is relatively happy with the Anglican Church, their copy of the Catholic Church. So what they do is they leave. They leave, Amer they leave England and they come to America uh, when England starts settling the Americas. We have two types of people come to the British colonies. People that come here for business and money, like in Virginia, for instance, or Carolinas. And then people who come to New England, up like Massachusetts, and they come here as basically running from religious persecution in Europe. We often think that people found in America were running from religious persecution. They were in the North. But in the rest of the America, from Virginia down to the Carolinas, they weren't coming here for religious reasons. They were coming here for money, for profit. But the Puritans, the pilgrims that do come to New England and Massachusetts and uh, uh, that region, 
those are those are people who are fleeing persecution in Europe, in England especially. Uh, this gives you an idea of all across Europe. We have Europe, which is mostly Catholic. That's this blue, mostly Catholic. However, all across the Catholic regions, you have here we have Anabaptists, we have Calvinists, we have Puritans, we have Lutherans. Of course, you have Eastern Orthodox, which is a from an earlier split in the Catholic Church going back centuries. And you still, of course, have the Muslim Empire, Muslims up here, uh, in uh, which are pushing on uh, Europe, which are pushing into Europe as well. Or I guess technically at this point, they're sort of being pushed out, I suppose. But there's still pressure. So you have so many different religious faiths here all running into each other, and most of them are willing to kill the others. Uh, lots of religious violence in Europe. No one has an exact number. Most historians say just in the 1500s alone, probably 2 million people died due to religious reasons, due to religious wars, religious persecutions, uh, religious violence, or violence stemming out of religious differences. Over 2 million dead in that century uh, as a direct result of a religious war, uh, primarily focused between Catholics, Protestants, and Muslims. Pretty rough. Sometimes you wonder what's the biggest killer in the world other than natural causes. Well, there's lots of arguments to be made, but I think there's a good argument to say religion. Religion might be one of the biggest killers in the world if you think of all through world history, uh, ranking right up there with disease and all the rest of that. Anyway, here's an idea. Here you see England is uh, Church of England, Anglican. You have Calvinist teachings up here in Scotland. Calvinist teachings here, Lutheran teachings all through here. So most of Northern Europe is Protestant, while most of Southern and Central Europe is still Catholic. And then this is what was the Holy Roman Empire. So this is still Catholic. And then you've got all this over here, which is Eastern Orthodox. Quite a mess if you think about it. Um, really ample, ample opportunity for anger and frustration and, uh, well, death. Ultimately, over the next couple of centuries, hundreds of thousands, millions of people come to America. One of the main reasons was to flee the violence of Europe, which often had to do with religion. All right, so that is where we end chapter one. Um, that is where we'll finish it right there. So, um, as I said at the beginning, uh, quizzes and exams information can come out of the chapter, can come out of my lecture. There'll be a discussion board assignment as well, which will come out of the lecture. And that's it. We will uh, pick this up with the next chapter, chapter number two. Thanks for watching.